just like God in me. Like I don't know what's going on. If anyone is still hungry and wants their seconds or their thirds, I believe there is a little bit more food left. Um, otherwise, if you're craving something sweet, it looks like there's a dessert table up there, so feel free to go up and grab yourself some dessert if you'd like.
Okay, everybody, if you could please grab whatever dessert you've got your eye on and take a seat back at your table. We will get commenced with tonight's festivities. I see there's still some people writing down their species on the checklist. That's fine. We've got some time. But please, when you can, make your way back to your tables. And we'll get started. Okay, I think that we'll get started. Again, if everybody could please take their seats. We'll get started with tonight's Birds and Beers event. I'll introduce myself for the evening. I know a lot of you, I see a lot of familiar faces, but to those that I haven't formally met, my name is Henrik Pacheco. I'm a member of the Ontario Field Ornithologists and a member of the general Ontario birding community. So I've seen a lot of you before, um, but I might as well just introduce myself anyway, so that we're not strangers. Now, uh, welcome. You guys have all made it to my two favorite things in the world, birds and beer. And you know what? This is the 2023 annual convention in Peterborough. Woo! Yeah! That's something worth cheering about. You guys made it fantastic. I've already heard about some great field trips that were led today. I'm excited to hear about tomorrow's field trips as well. But of course, we have some things to get up to tonight, some fun stuff. Um, now, before anything, uh, I'd like to do a land acknowledgement of where we are. I'd like to respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of the Mississauga Anishinaabeg, and we offer our gratitude to the First Nations for their care for and teachings about our earth and our relations. May we honor these teachings. In addition, I would also like to introduce Sue Paradis. Did I... Get that right, Sue? I hope I did. She is the president uh, and the outings coordinator for the Peterborough Field Naturalists Club. So, round of applause for Sue. Fantastic, there you are. Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to Peterborough. Um, oops. On behalf, now I've already proven that I'm technologically challenged. And I don't have a PowerPoint as a result. <laughs> I also don't have much of a memory, so I'll be reading my remarks. But I do extend a warm welcome to all of you. I've heard some good birding took place today, and I hope the same for tomorrow and Sunday. As mentioned in your brochure, Peterborough is located in the land in between. So we're fortunate that an hour's north and we're on the Canadian Shield, an hour south we're at Lake Ontario. So it makes for great diversity for birding. This weekend's extensive offering of outings shows just how diverse the area is. I'd like to take a few minutes to share some of the history of Peterborough, Peterborough Field Naturalist, and all of its accomplishments. It has been involved in many projects and publications during its 83 years. In addition, thousands of dollars have been donated to other nature groups, to students, and to help fund the preservation of natural spaces. Many of the volunteers responsible for more recent accomplishments are in this room, and many of them are leading outings this weekend. So, 1949 and 50, and then again in 1960, our president, was J.L. McKeever. He, Larry McKeever, and his wife Kay, 
uh, lived in the area for a long time. We were very involved with the Peterborough Field Naturalists until they left for the Niagara region where they started the Owl Foundation. He also wrote our first newsletter. It's now called The Orchid. Some of you have picked up some samples from our table over there. And it includes a diary of sightings. In 1956, the first cardinals were spotted in the area and an urgent appeal to the members went out for their sightings. The first house finch was seen in August 1980 and also noted in the book Our Heritage of Birds by Doug Sadler. That bird originated in Mexico and Southern California and was captured, brought to New York City and was being sold illegally as Hollywood finch. But the wildlife officials were catching up to the sellers and the owners, so they all released the birds. And 40 years later, they made it this far to Peterborough. The orchid also provided data for a fourth year Trent University biology student, McLean Smith. In 2018, he reviewed the Dor orchid diary from 1948 to 2016 and compiled reports of seven species, including Canada goose, northern cardinal, house finch, purple finch, red-bellied woodpecker, wild turkey, and American robin. He compared the relative abundance in the number of reported sightings in the orchid to the relative abundance from the Christmas bird counts in the breeding bird surveys. His analysis indicated that unstructured citizen science, the orchid reviews, was a useful predictor of the appearance of a novel bird species to the area. Reports in the orchid predated the detection of the species and the bird counts in the breeding bird surveys. However, the observations weren't consistent for tracking the abundance once established. Once it became common, members stopped reporting. His paper, Structured and Unstructured Citizen Science, 70 Years of Bird Observations near Peterborough, was published in the Journal for Nature Conservation, which is a scientific journal focusing on methods and techniques used in nature conservation. Not bad for a fourth year student. In 1951, Roger Tory Peterson spoke at our AGM. I wasn't there. The PFN has operated the Christmas bird count annually since December 52. This is the longest continuous wildlife survey in Peterborough County. Many members also participate in the Petroglyphs bird count, which samples the Southern Shield area. In 1957, Burnham Woods, an old growth forest on the outskirts of Peterborough, became a provincial park. Two of the Burnham family were members of the PFN at the time and wanted to donate the property for the public to enjoy. PFN committee was formed and a decision was made to create Mark S. Burnham Provincial Park, a day use facility. The field naturalists um, took on a stewardship role and in the 60s would patrol the park in the spring to encourage people not to pick the trilliums and the other wildflowers. In 1955, or 59, Save the Bluebird campaign began and encouraged members to build nesting boxes as the birds were struggling. The dawn course, the dawn awakening, was held during the 60s and 70s and was a popular annual outing. It was held to record the time the first individual of different species of birds started singing. The activity was held on the property of Harry Williams and started at 3.30 in the morning, ending around 6. The data sheets from this event were recently given to one of our members by the daughter of Mr. Williams, and he is having them copied and sent to the Royal Ontario Museum and Birds Canada with the originals in the Trent University archives. It's expected that numerous studies will come from this valuable data. In 61, 50 wood duck boxes were built and distributed through the area. In 22, another member built more and installed some out at the Lakefield Sewage Lagoons. He's in the room, <laughs> but I'm not mentioning any names. <laughs> in 1978, members were advocating for the protection of the cabin bog, which eventually led to it being declared a provincially significant wetland. In 1979, members began an inventory of the flora and fauna of the proposed Harper Park, and it eventually received provincially significant wetland status in 2017. 
It's located in the city limits and is uh, well known for um, being the only area in the province where urban brook trout still are breeding. In the late 80s, the PFN constructed 10 osprey nesting platforms and put them up throughout the region. These aided in the recovery of the species in the Corthus. In the 80s, we also provided bird feeders to several retirement homes in Peterborough, and letters on file indicate that the project was well received by residents. Several years ago, we provided feeders to hospice. In 1990, due to lobbying, the loggerhead marsh within the city limits was also declared a provincially significant wetland. In 1990, or sorry, said that already. Members have been good advocates for nature and natural spaces for years. Not only have they lobbied for the preservation of those precious spaces, but they sat on committees with the city, such as the Eco Council and the Peterborough Nature Area Strategy. Also lobbied during the creation of the Peterborough's official plan. Miller Creek stewardship contributed both financial resources and labor in the construction of the viewing tower at Miller Creek, a large local marsh. Financial assistance was also provided by the Ministry of Natural Resources. For years, the PFN maintained the walking trails and signs and did safety inspections and species inventory. Autonomy Region Conservation Authority now manages the property. In the 1990s, we held water waterfowl viewing weekends on the shores of Little Lake. Uh, members would set up their scopes and invited the public to come and see the migrating waterfowl. In 93, also on Little Lake, shoreline restoration was done at Little Lake Cemetery, and it's a really popular spot to bird along the shores of the river and the lake in the winter. In 96, three bird feeders were installed at Ecology Park near the lake. Volunteers continue to keep them filled throughout the winter. In 2002, with the FON, a 250-foot boardwalk project was initiated in the wildlife sanctuary at Trent University. The PFN has contributed $10,000 to the construction of the Camp Corth Environment Center, $1,000 to the Brighton Marsh purchase, $1,000 towards the purchase of Kortha Land Trust, Chris Lee Bentham Wetland, and for the Boyle, Boyd Island Protection. Recent accomplishments include Peterborough being certified as a bird-friendly city. The Great Blue Heron was voted on by Peterborough citizens to be our official bird. When the certification was celebrated, thanks to a donation from the Hunter family, we donated birding kits to the library, including birding books and um, binoculars that people can can borrow. In closing, I'd like to say that Peterborough is not only rich in the natural world, but we're also rich in the people dedicated to the preservation of wildlife in our environment. All of these accomplishments are thanks to the members. They come from all walks of life, but we're also fortunate to be the home of Trent University, Fleming College, and the MNRF. These institutions have brought staff and students to our community with knowledge and a willingness to share. Many of them will be sharing their favorite hot spots in the area over the weekend, and thanks to those volunteers. Birdcast is predicting good movement this weekend, so I hope you enjoy your birding. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sue. Uh, it's easy to be out birding in a place like Peterborough and forget that birding is more than a hobby and the Peterborough Field Naturalist Club and the information that you've just provided can certainly attest to that. Next, I would like to introduce Mike Burrell. He is a provincial zoologist with the NHIC, um, but more than that, he is a, well, Peterborough Field Naturalist. He's from the area here. Uh, I think I met Mike when I was 13, so I've known him for too long at this point. I, f I feel like most people know Mike. Um, he's got, it's hard to find something in the Ontario birding community where Mike hasn't somehow dug his roots into and been involved in in one way or another. So could you all please assist me in welcoming Mike Burrell.
All right, great. Thanks, Enrique. Uh, thank, thanks, Sue. And thanks, everybody, for, for coming. And Oh, oh boy. Um, yeah, so I was asked if I could give the, the Friday evening presentation uh, as part of the Birds and Beers. And I've been to a few of these conventions before, so uh, I, I drew on my knowledge of what people usually talk about. And originally, I was going to talk about the Breeding Bird Atlas, which I'm, I'm currently working on. Um, but that seemed a little too narrow. And then I was supposed to talk about birding hotspots in Peterborough, but that seemed kind of boring because you're going to get to go see those places in, in person. Um, so I just, my talk is just birding in Peterborough. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what it's like to be a birder in Peterborough uh, and what makes this a, a special place. Um, before we, we get really into it, uh, usually this presentation has some jokes. So I thought I better get some jokes in here. And I, I was kind of, I was trying to figure out how I could be kind of current with the times and so what I did was I opened up ChatGPT and I got it to write me some jokes. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get, get started here with one. Okay, and this one, they, these are all about Henrique. Um, okay, so here's our, here's our first joke courtesy of ChatGPT. Uh, why did Henrique, the birder, invite a woodpecker to the OFO, Ornithological Fanatics Organization, convention? because he wanted someone who could really drum up some excitement at the event. <laughs> pretty good, pretty good. Okay, I got one more here. Um, where is that one? Oh yeah, here we go. Why did they kick Henrique out of the OFO convention? Because he couldn't stop ruffling the feathers of his fellow bird enthusiasts with his endless bird puns. <laughs> All right, I got one more, I'll save it for the end. But, so you got something to look forward to. So, so the, the other thing that these presentations usually do is they tell you a little bit about some of the really, really rare birds that have been seen in the area. So I'm gonna do that, but it's not gonna take a lot of time. So I'll have to talk about something else in a little bit. So one of our rarest birds that's ever been seen in Peterborough is, is this guy. You can see the stellar photo, thanks to Doug McRae. Uh, it's circled there, in case you couldn't see it. Uh, this is a spotted red shank that was at the Lakefield Sewage Lagoons. Hands up if you were there today. Couple people. Did you see a spotted red shank? No? Okay, well. Uh, this was there in uh, 1981, just for two days, and this at the time was the second record. There's only been two more since then. So this is a super, super rare bird um, that, that uh, appeared in Peterborough. Our next, next guy is this one, uh, and the photo uh, credit is missing, but that's from uh, Bob Curry. He took this photo. Uh, this is a swallow-tailed kite. Uh, and this was at the time just the second record of swallow-tailed kite in Ontario. Since then, we've had quite a few, especially in the last 10 years or so. Uh, this one spent 10 days, uh, I'm told, uh, right outside the liquor store in Buckhorn <laughs> uh, back in 1982. So you could get a, a real convenient one-two. You could go get your rare bird and, and some liquor. Now probably the rarest bird ever seen in Peterborough is this guy. This is another photo thanks to Bob Curry, uh, a broad-billed hummingbird from October 1989. This was also in Buckhorn, a little farther from the LCBO though. Um, and that's still the only record we've had of this species in Ontario. So that's a lot of 1980s birds. Um, I had to find one recent run because there have been some more recent rare birds here. Um, so I picked this guy. And the finder is, is back there. Matt, give it a little wave. Uh, that is, and we lost our photo caption for this one too. Uh, that's from Matt Garvin. He found this magnificent frigate bird on Shemong Lake uh, back in September 2020. Uh, and, and that's just the sixth of eight records for the province. So pretty darn rare. Uh, we do have some pretty rare birds that have shown up here. That's really not Peterborough's strength though. Oh, well, he was fishing, I'm sure. 
Um, so th there have been some pretty rare birds, uh, but it's not Peterborough's strength. We're not, we're not on one of the Great Lakes. We're not on the Ottawa River. Um, we don't have the natural features kind of working in our advantage to, to funnel rare birds and huge concentrations of migrants here. But it is a really special place to come birding. So I want to tell you a little bit about what makes it so special um, over the next few minutes. Um, and hopefully you're all convinced that Peterborough is the best place to, to be a birder. So we, we want to we wanna start and talk about where Peterborough is situated. And Henrique did a, a great land acknowledgement. We are in the middle of a place that has been frequented by, by people for a very long time. Well before Europeans arrived, uh, this is the traditional lands of, of several different indigenous nations. And they, they've been here, as I said, for hundreds of years before Europeans. The area uh, that we're in right now was known as the Nogo Jawanan, or the place at the end of the rapids. And the Autonomy River, which you've probably all driven over a couple times already, it's an English corruption of a word that meant river that beats like a heart. So it's always been a very important place for our people before Europeans arrived here. Um, owing to its, its abundance of animals and plants. The early Europeans that arrived here included people like Catherine Parr Trail, and they had a, a tough time settling in, in the Peterborough area because we have some rugged landscapes. This is a, a, a satellite view from Google Maps showing Peterborough in the middle, and you can see um, the dark line of forest. I've outlined it there. That's the edge of the Canadian Shield, and Sue already mentioned that Peterborough is, is in a really unique spot because we're just south of the edge of the Canadian Shield, but we're also close to Lake Ontario. So we're at this really interesting transition zone between the limestone plains of southern Ontario and the, the, the uh, Canadian Shield further north in central Ontario. As a result, we have a really varied landscape in the Peterborough area. Lots of agriculture south of Peterborough, the city. Uh, but as you move north of the city, you get closer to that transition zone and you start having um, lots of rocky outcrops and areas that are just not suitable for farming, which means the areas are a little more natural in terms of their habitat. Lots of wetlands, lots of big chunks of forest, um, and we have these amazing drumlin fields around Peterborough as well, which have forest on top and then wetlands in between. So it's a really rich, really diverse area um, for everything, birds included. If you have a look at uh, a map from the last breeding bird atlas from 2025, 2021 to 20, or 20, 2001 to 2005, you can see the Peterborough area is right on that transition um, where the highest number of species have been found. That's the edge of the Canadian Shield, and Peterborough is pretty much smack dab in the middle of it. We have an amazing diversity of breeding species here. Um, we have red crossbills. I'm just going to go clockwise around this, this photo. We have red crossbills year-round. You can find a red crossbill almost any time of the year. Uh, sometimes it takes a bit of luck, but if you go up on the Canadian Shield, you can find red crossbills with, with, some, with some regularity. We have amazing grassland birds still, so things like the upland sandpiper and grasshopper sparrow are still found. Upland sandpipers, lower numbers than grasshopper sparrows, but we're one of the best places to see these birds in the province. In the northern parts of the county, there are still a few Canada jays. And in winter, Peterborough area is one of the best places to come across something like a great gray owl. And this great gray owl is actually from my yard, just outside of Peterborough. During the, the big eruption in the 2004 winter, you could drive outside of Peterborough and you'd have a hard time not seeing a great gray owl. There's an abundance of small wetlands, as I mentioned, um, and things like least bitterns, uh, Virginia rails and soras are something that's relatively easy to find in the Peterborough area. Where the, where the transition zone to the Canadian Shield starts, 
We have golden winged warblers in many, many locations in Peterborough still. And one of our most abundant breeders in Peterborough is the American red start, as, along with over a dozen other species of warblers. So it is a really fantastic place to be, especially in the summertime, but, but in the wintertime, we get a, a nice mix of northern things coming here as well. Another part of what makes Peterborough a real special place, Sue also mentioned, we've got an amazing mix of employers that attract people interested in nature. We have Fleming College here, we have Trent University, we have the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, and we have the Peterborough Field Naturalists, which is one of the biggest and most active naturalist clubs in Southern Ontario. So we've got a great uh, mix of people coming here that are interested in birds and nature. I wanted to mention a few of our, of our all-stars. We've got people like Erica Knoll, an international shorebird expert from Trent University. Uh, Jody O'Laire doesn't live here anymore, but he grew up in the Peterborough area. He's a, a citizen science person that works with Birds, Birds Canada, as well as an international field guide. Drew Monkman is a well-known local author who writes extensively about nature and birds. Peter Burke grew up here as well. He's a, a well-known, internationally well-known uh, birding ar artist. Doug McRae, he migrated out of here and went to Presqu'il, but uh, he grew up in the Peterborough area and he's known to most of you, I'm sure. Um, Ken Abraham, also here today. Uh, he's a well-known international expert on waterfowl who worked for a long time at the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. And then Joe Pitawanaquat is doing some amazing work here, right out of Peterborough, um, looking at the use of um, bird names in Anishinaabe Moan. So we've got an amazing mix of people here that make our birding community really special. As a result, we have one of the most active birding communities in the entire province. We're number three on eBird when it comes to number of checklists. And we're behind Toronto, which has 3 million people, and Ottawa, which has about a million. Peterborough has about 150,000 people. So we're punching well above our weight class when it comes to um, collecting data for things like eBird, things like the Breeding Bird Atlas. This is a map showing uh, the number of point counts that have been completed so far in this, in this third Breeding Bird Atlas. And you can see Peterborough is one of the few regions that's almost finished its point counts already even though we've only finished our third year. We've got a little more work to do when it comes to number of hours of effort on the, the Breeding Bird Atlas, and this is where I wanna make a call for anybody who's out in the audience today. We need lots more help with the Breeding Bird Atlas, so come find me after the talk or tomorrow. Peterborough is also one of the leaders when it comes to some of the OFO initiatives that are going on right now, one of them being uh, populating hotspot descriptions on the uh, birdinghotspots.org website. And Peterborough's got a real full mix of, of their hotspots there with photos um, and explanations about how to bird at those places. If you haven't checked out this website, please do. It's just birdinghotspots.org. You can add your own photos or, or information about those sites. Um, or in the case of Peterborough, most of them are, are already completed, so you can go and, and find out about the places that you might want to visit. And Peterborough was also the perfect test case um, for our automated eBird alert system that Ivor Williams and I put together on the OFO's Discord server. Um, and, and this is taking those eBird sightings that are being put in and then filtering those uh, against some custom filters uh, so that you get alerts of the super rare stuff in a, in, a, in a region like Peterborough. So not too many popping up, but uh, these, are, these are the rare things that are showing up right now on the OFO Discord server for Peterborough. So that's, that's about it. I do have one more joke for you. <laughs> um, but before I tell you it, I did want to just say um, that it is a great place to be a birder. We may not have the rarities that other places like maybe Point Pelee do, but it is a very special place to come. It's fun to be here at any time of the year. We've got a great community of birders. 
there's always, um, you're always running into other birders out on the, the street or they're parked out front of your house because you reported something. Um, but it's a, it is a great place. Okay, so here's our last joke from ChatGPT. Why did Henrique decide to leave the OFO convention early? Because he realized it was time to fly the coop and get back to his beloved birds. <laughs> All right, well, thanks very much. Enjoy the trivia. I uh, logged into ChatGPT during that presentation. <laughs> uh, you know what, Mike? I, I got to hand it to you. These jokes are really not that good. I mean, AI should stick to doing other things other than writing jokes. But I did come up with, or sorry, uh, ChatGPT did come up with a decent one. Why did Mike take up birding as a hobby? Because he heard it was the only activity where he could wing it. Ooh. <laughs> I know, it's not, not really that great, but you know what it'll do. I had to say something. Okay, the next part of tonight is a really fun one. Uh, you'll notice that on your tables, each of you guys has a sheet. Um, that sheet has categories and spaces for answers. Some tables don't have sheets, is that correct? Okay, there's a few tables that do not have sheets. I I guess we'll get that sorted for you. Now, uh, it's everyone's favorite time of the Birds and Beers evening. We are doing our birding quiz. Woo! Fun, awesome. And of course, that won't be me doing that. No, 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 that'll be none other than the person who's always doing it, Sarah Rupert. Now, yes, round of applause for Sarah. She can't, I don't think she can hear you um, because she's not here, but she is being live streamed from Leamington. I mean, why would you leave Peely if you didn't need to, right? So uh, I believe you'll bring Sarah up on the screen and we'll get started with the birding quiz. All right. All right, I guess I'm good to start. Hi, everyone. Um, it's good to see, well, I, I can't see your faces, but I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person today, but I still wanted to do the trivia challenge. Um, I hope everyone's got their answer sheets and have chosen wisely who they've sought with this evening. Um, and we will start to get into things. Um, I just wanted to let everyone know that there is now a coveted trophy. Um, I hope everyone's seen the trophy. Um, and just a, a, an aside, you get to take the trophy home with you, but you need to bring it back next year for um, the next person who's going to win. 
So without further ado, I'm gonna share my screen and um, we'll get going. All right. Is everyone seeing that okay? Can you even get a thumbs up in the chat? All right, I think we're good to go. Uh, so let's get started. All right. So our first category is the mixed bag. Um, and we're gonna start off with this question. The red-eyed vireo holds the record for the most repeated songs in a row with 22,147. How many hours did it take to complete this symphony? Is it A, 10 hours, B, eight hours, C, 11 hours, or D, nine hours? And after each section, we'll go through the answers, so we're not doing it all at the end, so it's a little easier and fresher in everybody's memories. All right, so we're gonna move on to our next question. What is the only species of duck known to scratch while in flight? Is it A, northern pintail, B, green gadwall, or D, blue winged teal? Everybody have a chance there. All right, so we'll go on to our next question. Oh. All right, which bird species has the most feathers? Approximately 22,500 feathers. Is it A, tundra swan, B, great gray owl, C, greater white-fronted goose, or D, mute swan? Okay, move on to number four. Merlin was formerly called Pigeon Hawk. What is the origin of this nickname? Is it A, it's gray coloration like a pigeon? B, it eats pigeons? C, it flies like a pigeon? Or D, it follows pigeons to find other prey bird flocks? Right. Move on to the next question. Many birds' names come from an imitation of their calls or songs. Which is not named after the sound of its own voice? Is it A, whippoorwill, B, killdeer, C, chickadee, or D, limpkin? All right, on to our next one. What is the common name of the bird family Troglodyte that literally means the cave dweller? Is it A, swifts, B, thrushes, C, wren, kingfishers? And no, you're not allowed to go and open up your field guide on your phone right now. Okay, 
All right, we're gonna move on to our next question. Which pair of birds was known as the black minister and the white minister for their plumage, which suggests a white vest worn with a mantle of the same of the named color in its name? Is it great black back and glaucus skull? Is it spruce grouse and ptarmigan, bobolink and snow bunting, or Canada jay and black billed magpie? In number eight, which of the following led to changes in the way that birds sing in many species in the past 100 years? Is it A, an evolutionary selection for more complex ear structure, B, imitating human music, C, board of the mates with typical song patterns of the species, or D, increase low frequency noise for machinery, traffic, et cetera. <laughs> All right. Move on to number nine. Most songbirds don't survive their first year of life. Of 100 songbirds hatched this spring, how many will survive to breed next year? Is it one to two, A, B, five to 10, C, 15 to 20, or D, 25 to 30? All right, I'll move on to our last question in this category. Why do many birds have white feathers layered beneath bright colors like red and yellow? Is it to conserve energy when growing so many feathers? Is it B, to give the colored feathers a brighter glow? C, red and yellow feathers provide very little warmth? Or D, all of the above? Okay, so let's go through and um, add up our scores for this category. Hopefully everybody's got things written down. So in the answers for the first one, the red-eyed vireo, how long did it take to repeat those songs? The answer is 10 hours. That is a very long time singing. And I just will also say, I'm glad it was not outside my window that 10 hours of that went on. All right, we're gonna move on to question two. So the only species of duck known to scratch while in flight, that is the green-winged teal. Which bird has the most feathers? That's the tundra swan. All right, number four, Why? Was, what's the origin of pigeon hawk nickname? And the answer is, it flies like a pigeon. Number five, I have a feeling most people got this one, it is indeed the Limkin who did not get its name because of its caller song. Number six, um, this one I knew not because I read field guides and scientific names, but because it's troglodytes in French, so it is wrens are the cave dwellers. Number seven, the black minister and the white minister. That's the great black backed and glauca skulls. All 
All right. What has changed to the way uh, led to changes in the way birds sing? It's increased low frequency noise for machinery, traffic, etc. All right. This uh, this question kind of just makes me sad no matter what the number is, but the answer is 15 to 20. So out of 100 birds that hatched out last spring, only 15 to 20 of them will survive to breed next year. And finally in this category, um, why do many birds have white feathers layered beneath the red and the yellow? And if you've ever seen the cardinals, this is one that I know this a lot of people will note with cardinals, they're surprised about those white feathers. And it's actually to give the colored feathers a brighter glow. All right, well, hopefully everybody's feeling okay. No one's feeling completely, completely defeated yet. Um, that's what the next category is for. Um, and I know Jeff Skevington's the audience and he's gonna just start groaning. And I decided that we were gonna go with blue this year. And I guess that's why they call it the blues because everyone seems to boohoo in this section. So I am going to give you an image like this with some blobs of blue, and you're gonna tell me what species it is. So here's our example. Everyone's looking at it, and this is an Eastern Bluebird. So I'm sure everyone's got it, and let the groaning begin. I can hear a little bit of noise from the microphone, but I'm feeling I might hear some loud groans this time. All right. I'm also getting, oh, everyone's saying they're hard. Okay, here's our first one. Can, can you see the blue okay? It's blue here. And I'm gonna give you a clue, there's more than one individual of this species in this image. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. We're gonna move to the next one. Now it was nice this year and I kind of tried to show you different shades of blue. So think of the blues in this family and, and what this might relate to. The other clue I'll give you is the bird is facing to the left of the screen. If that helps at all. I don't know if it will or not, but I'll try and give you a few little clues along the way this time. All right, gonna move on now to number three. All right, I'm gonna go to number four. Okay, we're ready for five.
All right, here's number five. to number six I can hear it still here there's lots of dialogue going on that's fun though glad you're discussing it all right here's number six Okay, we're ready to move on. We're going to go to number seven now. Okay, we're on to number eight. Okay, we're gonna move on to number nine. The torture is almost over, folks. Okay, and we're gonna move to the last one. Everybody, are you ready to learn what all these blobs actually were? Nobody's hate texted me yet, so that's a good sign. Nobody totally hates me yet. Um, you might after I reveal the answer. So the first one, this is Blue Winged Teal. Okay, number two is Cerulean Warbler. Oh, I can see, I can see the tables now. For, well, for two seconds I did. All right, number three is Great Blue Heron. Okay. Hoping that a few people got that one. Number four 
I told that I was told that I had everyone stumped on this one. Oh. It was a King Eider. Okay. Number five. Did you put down Harlequin Duck for that one? Number six. It's a duck with a blue bill. You're ready, duck. All right, number seven. Is blue gross beak? Number eight is Prothonotary Warbler. Number nine is the Red Breasted Nuthatch. And finally, number 10 is the Blue Headed Vireo. And shout out to Susan who has been um, uh, cheering and booing through the whole uh, answer session. I appreciate it. All right, we're gonna move on now and we're gonna talk about recent rarities. So let's test our knowledge on some of the birds that a lot of us have probably chased around the province. I have a feeling this will be a category people like better and we'll probably have a few more answers for. We got the hardest one out of the way, hopefully. All right, this species had birders looking through rose-colored glasses over the last couple of weeks. Okay, number two. It's been a hot Limkin summer in Eastern North America. Name two locations where this species was spotted in Ontario this season. And if you name all three, you get a bonus point. Number three. Only present for a couple of hours, this Peely first was especially unexpected that far south. Can you repeat that? Can't see it. Can't see it. Can't read it. Only present for a couple of hours, this Peely first was especially unexpected that far south. Thank you for whoever read that for me. Okay, you guys can hear me okay though, right? Okay. All right. Um, and Mike did, did say this already, so I don't feel so bad. But while not always a hot spot for the rarities, Peterborough hosted this Boreal speci specialty last winter, seen by many, and it was at a feeder. All right, and number five. This bird should have been on the East Coast in early September, but dropped in for a visit to Hamilton. All right, we're gonna move on to number six. After a stint in wildlife rehab, I felt I had to add the wildlife in because otherwise it would have sounded like it was a drug addict. Uh, birders had the unique experience of tracking the movements of this rarity after it was released. Hey. This species was noted in both Perth and Peely this year.
All right. Many people got to meet Phyllis, a most gracious host, when they visited Manitoulin this winter to see this species. Sorry about that black on red, it doesn't seem to translate well on the big screen. All right. A lot of people were missing the perch tacos when they were enjoying this species just north of Peely. Right. And finally, the Kidden Road was one of the hottest birding spots in April with the arrival of this species. All right, so let's, let's go through this. Our bird through rose-colored glasses was, of course, the roseate spoonbell. The Limkin locations were Warwick in Lambton County, Minnesing Wetland, McKinnon Road, and Mississippi River in Lanark County. So you needed two of those locations to get one point, and if you get all three, uh, give yourself a bonus point. does not count. It was in Ontario. <laughs> nice try, though. All right. The, the few-hour wonder at Peely was the willow ptarmigan. Number four for the Peterborough was boreal chickadee. And number five in Hamilton was a Manx shearwater. All right, I'm gonna go on to number six, was the ferruginous hawk. Number seven is white wing tern. Number eight, Lewis's woodpecker. Number nine, Casson's kingbird. And finally, number 10 was the white wagtail. All right, so we are now officially halfway through but we'll breeze through the next few categories. So these are birds and culture. So um, there's a lot of different things we can think about with birds from a cultural perspective. So there's one introduced species in Eastern North America that is actually a native species from the West. They escaped captivity during the bird trade in the 1930s. Is it A, cactus wren, B, black phoebe, C, house finch, or D, house sparrow? Why were mute swans brought to North America in the 18th century? Is it A, as livestock raised for food, B, as sources of feathers for hats and accessories, C, as ornamental additions to parks and estate ponds, or D, to interbreed with native trumpeter swans? Right. Moving on, which birds supplied the majority of the feathers for writing quills for writers before the advent of the fountain pen in the 19th century? Is it A, geese, B, chickens, C, eagles, or D, ravens? Yeah. 
Okay. What class of birds was left unprotected by the Migratory Treaty Act of 1918? Is it A, introduced an exotic species, B, birds that don't migrate, C, game birds, or D, bald eagles? All right, here we go. Which cartoon characters, bright red coiffure and trademark laugh are both modeled after a real bird? Is it A, Go-Go Dodo, B, Daffy Duck, C, Woody Woodpecker, or D, Tweety Bird? According to John McRae's World War I poem, In Flanders Fields, what birds were still bravely singing, flying, scarce heard amongst, amid the guns below? Is it A, nightingale, B, larks, C, robins, or D, doves? Right. Now I'll tell you, I saw this movie when I was about seven years old, which is entirely too young to see this movie. But what is the first bird shown attacking someone on screen in Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds? Was it A, a crow, B, a gull, C, a woodpecker, or D, a goose. <laughs> All right. A 2017 internet phenomenon poking fun at conspiracy theorists asserted that birds aren't real and that the flying creatures are actually what? Is it A, government spy drones, B, hallucinations due to drugs slipped into the water supply, C, mutated insects, or D, aliens? Um, anyone who knows me knows I really, really love Star Wars, so I decided this would be a good one to put in. What are the large-eyed, round-bodied birds featured on the planet Octo in Star Wars Episode Seven: The Last Jedi called? Are they Blorgs, B. Torgs, C. Porgs, or D. Gorgs? So I hope you have a Star Wars nerd at your table who can help you answer the question. I think they kind of look like if you crossed a puffin with a guinea pig. All right, and here's our final question in this category. What bird was commonly associated with, a, with Athena, the ancient Greek goddess of wisdom and war? Is it A, eagle, B, cormorant, C, pigeon, or D, owl? All right, well, we're gonna go through now and uh, 
take up this category. So the introduced uh, species to North America that's native to Western North America is indeed the house finch. Mute swans were ornamental additions to parks and estate ponds. The feathers for quills came from geese. Uh, the class of birds that was left unprotected were introduced an exotic species. Um, I'm hoping everyone got this one. It's our good old friend, Woody Woodpecker. Uh, in Flanders Fields, it's larks. The first bird to attack someone on screen was a gull. So if I remember correctly, I think every single one of those birds attacked somebody at some point. I definitely know the crows did, and I remember the woodpecker. Um, birds aren't real. They think they are government spy drones. They are called porgs. And finally, Athena's uh, bird was the owl. All right, so let's move on to sing, sing, sing. And you guys know I like to have fun with birds in song and birds in songs. And so this year it's gonna be birds in songs. So some bird artists, some uh, bands, some sound clips. There's, there's a lot of different things here. Um, so first off, first, this song and dance was featured in the film Purple Rain. This is the guy performing it, and he would flap his arms around a lot while doing this dance. So what do you think the dance is called? And the clue I'll give you is don't think too hard on it. It's, a, it's, it's pretty basic. All right, number two. Anne Murray was the first Canadian woman to win a gold record for this song featuring a winter bird. I'm gonna play you a little song clip in this next one. Name this birdie song by They Might Be Giants. Shoot, shoot, shoot. Mm. Oh, come on. Sorry. Okay, let's see if we can get this to go. Hope everyone could hear that okay. I will give you a clue. The title of the song is included in the lyrics in that clip. All right. We're on to the next one. So this is one of the funniest covers that I have ever seen, heard of um, Mockingbird. Who wrote the song that we're gonna enjoy right now? Yeah, yeah, Mockingbird. The great maximum. All right. 
States. So who wrote Mockingbird? Me. All right. Our next one is Skybird was the theme from what movie that also features the name of a bird in its title? Okay. All right, I'd like you to name this band. And the clue is the hairstyle is, is pretty significant. All right. Um, what fictional band featured this artwork? in the introduction to their TV show. This is number seven. Okay. Number eight, members of this band included the late Birdwatcher's Digest editor, Bill Thompson III, and artist, Julie Zickfuss. Number nine, this band with a bird name was founded by members Glenn Fry, Don Henley, Bernie Leadon, and Randy Meisner in 1971. All right. <laughs> and we have one left. This band sings a song that is named after a British version. Um, the band is named after a British version of a swallow. We'll be living in a world of peace. I like to think they're all pointing at birds now in that part of the video. All right, so let's take up this category. You guys either love me or hate me for this one. Um, so the first one is the name of the dance, and the song is called The Bird, and the band is The Time. And if you've seen Purple Rain, you know what it's all about. And if you've never seen it, you're probably thinking I'm crazy. Number two was Snowbird by Anne Murray. Number three was Birdhouse in Your Soul by They Might Be Giants. Currently a ringtone on my phone. Uh, Mockingbird was written by Carly Simon. And Scott Bird was the theme song from Jonathan Livingston's Seagull, and it was sung by Neil Diamond. Number six, the band with the hair was Flock of Seagulls. The band with the partridges were the partridge family, the quails. The, the band that Bill Thompson III and Julie Zickfuss were in was Rain Crows. And the Eagles were uh, founded by Don Henley and crew. And finally, the last little got group we saw were the House Martins. So hopefully everybody got some points um, in that round. It's one point each. And now we're on to the last one. And this is what I'm gonna give you guys five minutes. Um, it's, it's one of my, let's mash up a bunch of birds not to scale and have you try and identify them all. So there are 15 birds. And so I figured since um, hunting didn't allow us to go to Gull Island, I thought we'd take a virtual trip. So these are all things that you could potentially see if you were to take a good trip to Gull Island. So I'm gonna put, 
let's say four minutes on the clock. And this is one where I know last year, a lot of people wanted to come and get a closer look at the screen. So please feel free to do that. Um, and I will let you know when the time's up. So here we go. Yes. We're down to 30 seconds. That's our four minutes. Does anyone need a little bit more time? I, I, it's nine o'clock now, so this is, I, I don't want to eat into your sleep time. Do you want another two minutes? Okay.
just got an iron ring. Hey everyone, we're down to our last 30 seconds. Okay, everyone, and that's it. That's our time. All right. We're going to take it up now. All right. So, number one is Black Bellied Plover. Number two is American Golden Plover. Number three is Pectoral Sandpiper. Number four is Ringbill Gull. Number five is Herring Gull. Six is American Pipit. Seven is White Rumped Sandpiper. Eight is Baird's Sandpiper. Nine is red knot. What was ten. I hope everyone got ten. Ten is Canada goose. Eleven, horned grebe. Twelve is Dunlin. Thirteen is red-breasted merganser. Fourteen is buff-breasted sandpiper. And finally, 15 is Caspian Turn. So hopefully we, we did okay on this. And I'll say thank you for playing. I'm just gonna um, stop sharing my screen and just talk to you guys. So um, I, is Enrique around and can maybe help me with this? I'll help you with the um, get, let's get the score. So did anyone get a perfect score tonight? <laughs> I, I, I'm hearing nothing. Anyone get a perfect score tonight? Did anybody get 70 tonight? Anyone get 70? How could we? It's 65. How about anyone 65 or up? Oh, do I see hands up for that one? Okay, I see hands up. So that means I can't see whose table that is, but you get the trophy if you got anybody. So what did you guys get there whose hands were waving? <laughs> 65 and a half. What was the half for? <laughs> All right, so um, that lovely team, you get to take home the trophy.
Uh, you can share it amongst yourselves over the next year. It's, it's a pretty fabulous trophy that you're going to get. Um, uh, we do ask that you bring it back to the convention next year so it can get passed along to the next trivia winners. Uh, and as well, there are some prizes there for people as well. So I hope you enjoyed it. And again, I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person, but I'm glad I was at least able to come uh, and do something with you virtually tonight. So have a great rest of the convention and I'll be tuning in from um, afar. Bye everybody. So in addition, the winning table also gets greeting cards by Art by Peely Girl, which is Sarah Rupert. So you guys can divvy those up amongst yourselves. There's some really nice artwork there. She's very talented. That was, that was fun. Stressful, but fun. <laughs> Every year, it's always, I, I always dread the color category. I feel like I've got it every year. I felt like blue was probably the one that I would do the best in, but no. In blue, how many did we get in blue? Four? Oh. <laughs> uh, we got six. We got six in blue. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Okay. Awesome, congratulations to the winning team. Um, that actually concludes tonight's Birds and Beers event. I hope you guys had a fantastic time. I certainly did. Yes, it was a ton of fun. We'll give a round of applause to everybody who helped coordinate tonight, as well as those in the kitchen who provided us our fantastic meal. Would you like to say some things? Can you ask everybody to keep this because that's their bitter number for the auction? Yes. So around your neck, you should all have a name tag. This is important. Uh, return your name tag to the front table because on the back of your name tag there is a number. This is an important number for the silent auction tomorrow. It will make sense tomorrow, but make sure that before you leave, you drop your name, ta name tag back off at the front. In addition, tomorrow night here at the same place, um, we're sharing this building as well with a hockey arena. And tomorrow I hear that there's a lot of junior hockey games going on. Um, so the parking lot might be full. Parking might be hard to find. Um, you can park if you find that parking is hard to find uh, in the nearby canoe museum just across the road there. Um, and I think that's all I need to mention. I'm really excited for tomorrow night and the silent auction. Have a wonderful day of birding tomorrow, everybody, and good night.